Welcome back, my little stem cells, to the wonderful world of cell biology. In last week's edition, you were introduced to the cell, what it means to be living, and the cell theory. As you learn more wonderful knowledge about the cell, you are sure to differentiate into a fully knowledgeable human. I mean, really, that's all that school is. We start out as totipotent stem cells, then eventually we decide which job we want to take as an adult cell. It's so philosophical. Our getup today is probably not that new in terms of knowledge, but it's good to have a recap. We need to get down with the structures of the cells. Hopefully you remember that the cell theory states that all living things consist of cells. Everything. I want to connect this topic to 5.3, which is all about the classification of living organisms. You know, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, that stuff. Well, recall that we have three domains. Two of those are archaebacteria and eubacteria. These are prokaryotes. The third is eukarya. Those are the eukaryotes. That is where we start. We need to learn about the parts of these two different types of cells and be able to compare the structures and functions. This is 1.2, ultra structure of cell. The essential idea here is eukaryotes have a much more complex structure than prokaryotes. Sit back, jot a few things down, and let's go. This lesson is once again sponsored by microscopes, the tool that is responsible for enabling us to see the microscopic world. Luckily for us, technology has enabled scientists to have different types of microscopes that perform slightly different functions. Two of those types are the light microscope and the electron microscope. Light microscopes, like the ones we have in our classroom, use light to bend and magnify the image. We can use them to study dead or living cells in color. Because we can study living organisms, we can see the movements and interactions between microscopic organisms. Electron microscopes, on the other hand, use electron beams focused by electromagnets to magnify and resolve. Unfortunately, this requires the cells or organism to be killed and chemically treated before they can be viewed, so no live viewing sessions. Because there is no stain or dye, there is no color that is able to be seen. But there are some really rad advantages of electron microscopes. You can see that we have two specific types of electron microscopes, the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. Both of these microscopes generate high resolution of subject matter. Resolution is essentially the fine details and intervals that the microscope can see. This allows for incredibly detailed images. Additionally, these electron microscopes have the ability to zoom in even further up to 250,000 times and study the smallest of small organisms. Light microscopes can only go up to 2,000 times. You can see in the example here that the resolution of an object is really important. While it might be an image in grayscale, this high resolution allows scientists to understand understand what the object truly looks like in the three-dimensional sense. So there you have it, the tools that are used to study these cells. As I mentioned, there are two cell varieties, the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. The most ancient type of cell that we have are the prokaryotic cell types. These are the oldest living organisms on record and first appear as far back as 3.8 million years ago. They are tiny in size, roughly about 10 micrometers. If we think about the classification, the prokaryotes include eubacteria, which are your everyday bacteria, and archaebacteria, which are the types that live in extreme conditions, things like halophiles, thermophiles, and other extremophiles. The reason for the the name prokaryote is that pro means before and karyon means without a nucleus. That tells you that prokaryotes are older cells that do not contain any nucleus, nor are any parts of their cells compartmentalized. This means that they just have a bunch of things floating around inside of the cell, and this is called intracellular. And there are things connected to the outside of the cell which we call extracellular. It is important to be able to know which parts of the cell are intracellular and which are extracellular, along with the functions of each of these parts. So let's break them down, starting with the inside of a cell. You are welcome to pause the video here so you can write down the functions. I will be zooming in so you have a visual as I describe each part. First off, you have the cytoplasm. This is the gel-like fluid substance that contains water and dissolved minerals. This is where all the parts of the inside of the cell float in and where the metabolic reactions take place. Next, you have the nucleoid. This is the DNA of the cell and has two ends that come together to form a circle. This DNA is just free floating. Next, you have the plasmids. This is a special piece of small circular DNA that can be shared between bacteria and often contains genes for antibiotic resistance. Another organelle on the inside are the ribosomes. These are the parts of the cell that build proteins during the translation. Prokaryotes 
have what are called 70S ribosomes, which are smaller than the ribosomes eukaryotic cells have. Eukaryotes have larger 80S ribosomes. Both, however, synthesize proteins and consist of two subunits. The last part, making up the barrier between intracellular and extracellular, is the cell membrane, which is also called the plasma membrane. This is the part that is responsible for regulating what materials move into and out of the cell. For the extracellular components, we have the cell wall, pili, the capsule, and the flagellum. Not all prokaryotes have all of these things, it just depends. The cell wall provides the shape to the cell and allows the cell to withstand and regulate pressure without bursting. The pili enable the cell to attach to surfaces, swap DNA with other cells. The capsule is the outermost layer and helps the cell keep from dehydrating and also can be used to adhere to other surfaces. Lastly, the flagellum, which are long tail-like extensions that are used in cell locomotion. So keep those parts in mind and their locations as we are going to be applying them soon. But Mr. O, you told me last week that all living things need to be able to reproduce. Prokaryotic cells do not do sexual reproduction, so how do we get more of them? I'm so happy you asked me. All prokaryotes use asexual reproduction, where offspring arise from one single parent cell, and the offspring are genetically identical to the parent. The two types of asexual reproduction are mitosis and binary fission. Prokaryotic cells use binary fission, so let me tell you about the steps and how they work. You can see the images below to give you the visual. The first step is preparing to divide. There must be enough energy and resources to cue the cell to divide. Second, the circular DNA gets copied in response to a replication signal. Next, the two DNA loops attach to different parts of the cell membrane, typically in opposite parts. The cell continues building more cell membrane and cell wall. This elongates the membrane, and then the cell wall and membrane begin to pinch inwards, creating little indentations called furrows into the cell's edge. This continues until the furrows meet and then a separation into two daughter cells will occur. They are genetically identical to the single cell from which they arose. This can happen super fast. In the GIF on the right, you can see this occurring. E. coli have been measured in their optimal conditions to go through a binary fission every 20 minutes. So this exponential growth is fast. However, we have talked about in topic 6.3 how humans can take antibiotics to disrupt the different parts of the bacteria's life and replication cycle. One skill that you need to work on refining is identification of these various parts of the prokaryotic cell. Not only do you have to label the cartoony image, but you have to be able to label the parts while looking at an image of a prokaryotic cell in an electron micrograph. You can see these images here. Can you label which parts of the cell are which? This can be a bit tricky. One tip is to not label things that are unclear. It's better to just not guess if you are completely unsure. So pause the video. Try to see if you can pick out where the lines are pointing. Hopefully you were successful. The nucleoid, plasma membrane, cell wall, and ribosomes were all easy to pick out. The pili were a bit more challenging, so practice this skill or looking at electron micrographs. Another skill you need to have is your sketching skills. Looking at a micrograph, you should be able to draw what you see and label the parts. You should be able to deduce what the functions of the cell might be based on the structures that are present. Make sure when you are sketching to be consistent with how you are seeing it. The position, the size, the labels, a scale for size, magnification level, and of course, the title of what you're seeing. Don't leave any questions for your viewing audience. In the set of three images below, you can see things that are highlighted. Hopefully you can tell that the bottom right purple is the flagella, the blue things in the middle are the pili, and the pink thing is the cell wall, and the pale yellow stuff is the nucleoid. So we have covered the prokaryotes, and now we move on to the third domain, the eukarya. The eukaryotes are the newer of the three domains and are thought to have evolved around 2.7 billion years ago from the prokaryotes. Eukaryotes are called this because you means good and carrion means nucleus. I know it doesn't make sense, but what it really means is that eukaryotes are organisms that contain a membrane-bound nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Let me remind you that we have different types of eukaryotic cells, which are classified as the kingdom. We have the fungi, I mean fungi, we have the protista, planta, and animalia. The organelles are compartmentalized. These compartments allow different conditions in each compartment, not interfering with the other. These help the cells with efficiency of metabolism, meaning enzymes can be localized and concentrated. Localized conditions, things like pH and other factors, can be kept at optimal levels. Toxic damaging substances 
lysis can be isolated, which means the digestive enzymes are able to be stored in lysosomes. And numbers and locations of organelles can be changed, depending on the cell's requirements. This makes eukaryotic cells much more differentiated, specialized, and efficient for functions. It's one of the reasons that eukaryotic organisms can be quite large, with different parts of the organism taking on different roles. I'm sure you know these things. So let's discuss the different organelles and their functions. I'm sure that you've heard about the different organelles before and had to learn their functions. You can see in the list at the middle of the page some of the similar organelles that prokaryotic cells share with eukaryotic cells, organelles that plant and animal eukaryotic cells share, and lastly, you can see that plant and animal eukaryotic cells have specific organelles that are unique for just those types. So let me roll through these while you look at the pictures. First, we have the ribosomes, which is the site of the polypeptide synthesis. The process is called translation. Ribosomes are made of two subunits, and prokaryotic cells have a smaller 70S version, while eukaryotes have an 80S version. The cytoskeleton is a filamentous scaffolding within the cytoplasm and provides internal structure and mediates intracellular transport. It's a bit less developed in prokaryotes. The plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer embedded with proteins and is semi-permeable and a selective barrier surrounding the cell. We will learn more about this in 1.3 and 1.4. Those are the organelles shared by both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. The nucleus is a double membrane structure with pores, contains an inner region called a nucleolus. It stores genetic material as chromatin, and the nucleolus is where the ribosomes are made. The endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER for short, is a membrane network that may be bare, called smooth ER, or studded with ribosomes, called rough ER. It transports materials between organelles. If it's the smooth ER, it is lipids, where the rough ER deals with proteins. The Golgi apparatus is is an assembly of vesicles and folded membranes located near the cell membrane, where sorting, storing, modification, and export of secretory products occurs. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, duh, and has a double membrane structure, inner membrane that's highly folded into what are called internal scriste. This is the site of aerobic respiration and where ATP energy is produced. The peroxisome is a membranous sac containing a variety of enzymes to help break down toxic substances. And and other metabolites. The centrosome is the microtubule organizing center that helps form spindle fibers and contribute to cell division for mitosis and meiosis. These are the organelles that are shared by the plant and animal cells. For animal cells alone, they have one other organelle called the lysosome, which are membranous sacs filled with enzymes to break down macromolecules. It is worth noting that the presence in plant cells is subject to debate. For plant cells, these have chloroplasts, vacuoles, and cell walls. Chloroplasts have a double membrane structure with internal stacks of membranous discs called thylakoids and are the place where photosynthesis occurs. These molecules are then stored in parts called plastids. The vacuole is a fluid-filled internal cavity surrounded by a membrane. This is really important in maintaining hydrostatic pressure and regulating the ratio of water to dissolved ions. Animal cells might have these in a temporary basis. Lastly, the cell wall is the external outer covering made of cellulose, and its function is to provide support and mechanical strength, as well as prevent excess water uptake. So there you have it. These are organelles of eukaryotic cells. Know them big time. One application of this topic is that eukaryotic cells are super duper extra special and can develop their own ways to become super efficient. I present to you the exocrine cells in animals and the palisade mesophyll cells in plants. Let's discuss the exocrine gland cells. You can see that these are the types of cells especially built for synthesizing and secreting substances out of the cells, things like sweat, milk, enzymes, acids, and so on. If you look at the image on the right, you can see that they are set up to have a special outer layer to facilitate many secretions leaving the cell. If you think about the job of an exocrine cell, you might be able to guess which organelles are plentiful. They are unique shapes that have the nucleus on one end, away from the outside, and structures like many Golgi apparatuses that are highly efficient to produce the secretions. Additionally, there are many, many vesicles that will deliver the secretion to the cell's membrane. On the plant side of things, let us discuss the palisade mesophyll cells. These are found within leaves. As I talk, I'll zoom in on the image so you can get a better look. Have a glance. You can see there are rectangular cells just under the surface. These cells have the largest number of chloroplasts Per cell. If you recall what you just learned, that means there's a lot of photosynthesis occurring. In fact,
fact, these palisade mesophyll cells are the primary site of photosynthesis. They are differentiated into highly compartmentalized cells and are super efficient at photosynthesis. They are also positioned vertically to maximize the chloroplast allotment and they're near to the surface so they can receive the sun. Here we have some more electron micrographs. Just like with prokaryotic cells, one skill you need to hone is the ability to pick out key organelles and also to deduce potential types of cells based on the number of organelles. For example, cells with many mitochondria typically undertake energy-consuming processes, things like neurons and muscle cells. Cells with extensive ER networks undertake secretory activities, things like exocrine gland cells. Cells rich in lysosomes tend to undertake digestive processes, things like phagocytes. Cells with chloroplasts undergo photosynthesis like we just talked about. It's a bit like playing detective. You read the micrograph for clues, then apply the knowledge about what you already know. The last two slides are here as a reminder that you need to be able to draw and label eukaryotic cells based on a micrograph. Here you can see the animal cell and below some of the key features that you should accurately be sketching. This is pretty straightforward, but just requires practice. I recommend pencils and colored pencils on this for the best outcomes. In this slide, you can see the plant cell and below some of the key features to keep in mind while you're sketching. Same thing goes, I recommend pencils and colored pencils on this for the best outcomes. That's all I've got for you, and I hope that you're working on making your sketches. If you are skilled at cross-stitching and have some time on your hands, you can create a complete cell with organelles. Whatever you do, just remember to take lots of selfies and stay woke to the bio. As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation script and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from IB Bio Ninja and some of the information used. Other images and info come from Biology for Life, Bionology, iBiology, and other sources too. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of IB Biology text, as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum, and this presentation should be used with a Creative Commons attribution license. So peace out.